In this video, I will show you how to use async await in C Sharp. If you're new to C Sharp and asynchronous programming seems a bit confusing, you're not alone. Even experienced C Sharp programmers are often not really sure how it actually works, especially because it's so easy to declare something as async, and if you're using ASP.NET and writing a web API, you basically cannot avoid it. So many programmers just use it without thinking about what it actually does unless there is an issue or a deadlock that they need to resolve. That's why in this video, I will show you a very common deadlock that can happen using async await. I will show you how to avoid it and also explain why it happens. But before we start, welcome to the channel. Here you can find topics about Linux, Docker, game dev or software development in general or short agile dev art. If you like that kind of content, then give a like, subscribe and smash the bell icon to get notified when I release new videos. All the links from this video are down in the description and also down there are the timestamps, so you can skip any part if you want. I'm now here in Visual Studio, the IDE, and I already prepared an example project called Async Deadlocks. It is a very simple old school Windows Forms application. I will start it so you can see what it is. So this is it, it's very simple, it contains only one button and an image box and it's called RoboGenerator. Now if I click on this button, it should get an image from a random API and it should render it here inside this image box. The code behind is here. Now in this video, I will not explain C Sharp basics like what a class is or what a method is or properties or events. I will focus mainly on async await and what it does. So this is more of an advanced topic and you should definitely know the basics first. Down here we have the button click handler. This one will handle the button click event. It will call the get image async method, which is up here. And this one will use an HTTP client and connect to the RoboHash API. This one also gets the image stream using an async method, get stream async, which then returns a task that we then await. Once the task result is ready, we create the image and then return it here to the caller. Once we have the image, we will put it inside the picture box. Now let's see if it actually works. Here is the GUI, generate. And nothing happens, I can't even drag the window around. It looks like it's stuck, I can't close it. Let's see where we are, I will pause. So we are inside the click handler and we are still waiting for the image result, which we will never get because probably you guessed it, a deadlock happened. Now you would probably think that once the image stream is ready, the await would return the task result and then the method would return the image back to the caller down here. The caller would get the image from the task result and just continue. But unfortunately this cannot happen, so let me explain why. I will stop this one. The short answer is that this task here is actually completed, but this await tries to return to the same context which this one down here is currently blocking. The button click handler blocks the whole thread on this task result call. If the thread is currently blocked, then this one cannot return to the same thread which it does by default. To understand how blocking works, we first need to understand what async await actually does. Basically, you can tag any method as async. From the caller perspective, this doesn't really matter. It will be called and executed as any other method synchronously. The important thing though is the await keyword. You can only await a task object. In this case, this is a task stream object that returns a stream as a result. Now, what this await does, if you give it a task that is already completed, it will continue as if nothing happened it will continue synchronously. So in our case, what this could mean is if you wait long enough for this task to be completed and then give it to await, it will continue synchronously as if nothing happened. So we could do something like thread sleep, let's say eight seconds, just to be sure that the image is downloaded and the task is completed. Let's see what will happen. Generate. And now after eight seconds, we got the image without a deadlock. But this is not what we actually want, because blocking the thread is like doing a synchronous call. We could instead just call a synchronous method here instead of this async method. The thread would be blocked and the result would be the same. A completed task is nice, but it's not what we have in our case. 
If a wait gets a task that is not already completed, then it wraps everything that it finds after the await and it sends it to a thread. In our example here, the thread would be the same one where await was originally called. And now this is important. Once everything was sent to a thread, await doesn't wait, it doesn't block, but it returns right away to the caller. And then the caller, in this case, the button click handler, continues executing. So the await keyword is a bit misleading because await never blocks, it never waits, it always yields a task back to the caller and continues executing. If you look at the IL code behind, async await methods are very similar to yield return methods where the method returns an enumerable. In both cases you will get a whole state machine out of the method, you will also get a move next method which yields the next result. So you can think of this await like a yield return task, for instance. So if this await isn't blocking at all, and we continue down here, and then try to get the result from the task, which is not yet completed, and we are doing it synchronously here by accessing the dot result property. So since this is done synchronously, we will block the thread. And as I said previously, since the thread is blocked, this code right here that was wrapped by the await and sent to the same thread which this one is currently blocking, this code here never gets executed. Because a thread is like a pipe. The flow will only continue once the blocking issue is resolved. And in our case, the flow will not continue because this code right here was basically pushed down here. We will never reach this code because we are blocked up here. So with that said, we know that the issue is caused by this code here being sent to the same thread. But why is it being sent to the same thread in the first place? This is the default behavior if the current thread has an associated synchronization context. Let's see what this actually is. I will make a breakpoint at the beginning of the click handler and start. Generate. The breakpoint is hit. And we can also see that we are currently running on the first thread. In a Windows Forms application, the first thread is also called the main thread. And now I will open the immediate window and write synchronization context dot current. So the current synchronization context is set to a Windows form synchronization context. And this one is associated with the first thread. Because of this synchronization context, every await that is called on the first thread will wrap the code and send it to the same first thread. Or in other words, it will execute the code in the same context. In a Windows Forms application, this is basically a feature because you can only update or change GUI elements on the first thread. Otherwise, you will get an exception. So this synchronization context makes sure that every async await returns to the same first thread. Now, of course, there is a way how you can avoid this behavior. On every task object, you can call something called configure await and inside put false. Now this configure await false will cause the await to behave like there is no current synchronization context, like it's set to null. And that means that this await will send the wrapped code to a free thread on the thread pool, which will be a random thread, but not the one where this await was originally called. So let's try it out. I will stop this. I will remove this breakpoint and put one here and one here and run. Generate. So before the await call, we are now on the first thread and the synchronization context is set to the Windows synchronization context. And now if I continue, now as you can see, we finally passed the await and we got here. And now the wrapped code is not running on the first thread, but instead it is running on the thread number 17. Let's check the synchronization context. This time the synchronization context is null because there is no synchronization context associated with this thread 17. Now let's continue with the execution and it works. We have the image. It's a good practice that if you're writing a library that could be consumed by other projects that you always put configure await false on every await in your library because you don't know if the library will be called from a thread that has a synchronization context or from one without it. With configure await false, you always know that the code after await will be executed on a different thread. Now this is one way how you can avoid deadlocks using configure await false. 
Now let's say I want to start this method without a synchronization context. You just need to do task run and call the method as an action or a delegate. The task run method will take this delegate or the action and send it always to a different thread. It will always return a task object and never wait or block for the execution. By using task run, we basically don't need to use configure await false here, because the whole method will be executed on a different thread that doesn't have a synchronization context. So let's remove configure await false and let's try it out. And generate. We are now again inside the method that was started using task run before the await call, and this time the method is executed on a thread number 10 and not on the thread number 1. Let's check the synchronization context. Synchronization context is null because, again, in a Windows Forms application, only the first thread has a synchronization context and the thread number 10 doesn't have it. And now, if I continue, again, we are past the await, so everything worked, and this wrapped code is now executed on thread number 15. So because there was no synchronization context when await was originally called, the wrapped code was sent to a different thread, in this case thread number 15. Let's continue. And here is the image. So by using task run, you can start a method without a synchronization context and that way avoid deadlocks. Now there is also a third way how you can avoid deadlocks and that's by making the event handler button click async. Let's remove task run. And this time we don't need to block the whole thread using task result, but instead we can do await task. This time instead of blocking and waiting for the result, the await will wrap the code that comes afterwards and send it to the same thread, in this case the thread number one. So now the thread will execute the code in the right order. First it will get the image and afterwards set the image in the picture box. One additional thing. Since this one isn't blocking, it will return to the caller immediately. In our case, this will be the caller of this event, button click, which is somewhere inside Windows Forms. And the Windows Forms code will continue executing, which is perfect because that means that also the GUI stays responsive. So it is a win-win situation and this is also the cleanest way how you can fix the deadlock. Let's remove the breakpoints and start. Generate. And here is the image. Let's try again. As I click generate, as you can see, the GUI stays responsive. Let's try another one. Nice. If you like my videos and also want to support me, I also have a Patreon page. I really appreciate all the support I get and it's because of your support that I can make videos like this one. So thank you very much. And the link to Patreon is up there or down in the description. As said, this is a very simple GUI that I created using Windows Forms. In a previous video, I also showed you how you can create, build and debug a simple cross-platform GUI written in GTK. So if you want to develop a cross-platform GUI written in GTK, you can check out the link to the video up there or down in the description. And that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, then like and subscribe. And if you really like the video, down there is a super thanks. So you can buy me a coffee, for instance, so I can make more of those awesome videos. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.